You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with, with Sam Cedar. It is Wednesday, September 5th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, Shockway Lumumba, for my time that I sat down with him at Netroots Nation. Also on the program today, handshakes and white power symbols aside, Brett Kavanaugh has a little fibbing problem. And it's a ton of fun, but honestly, F. Bob Woodward. Ayanna Presley unseats fellow progressive Mike Quapano. Uh, Capriano. Capriano. In the, well, not just Somerville, but in Massachusetts 7th. Also on the program today, Facebook and Twitter grilled on the hill today. And finally, we're going to get to the bottom of this shadow banning stuff. (laughs) Next up, for President Trump, protests should be illegal. And lastly, 20 Republican states attorneys are in court to strip their fellow Americans of the protections, no pre-existing condition prohibitions to getting health insurance. All that and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it is... um, it is Wednesday, day two of our return back from vacation. Um, and also uh, the day, I have to say, is uh, the uh, my kids um, have gone to school. To, today was Saul's very first day. Yes, thank you, as a kindergartner. And uh, I have received reports. They do only do a half day on today because they want to make it as difficult as possible for parents um, to coordinate these things. Uh, but uh, the reports are uh, that he loved it. He was a little weepy this morning when I dropped him off, but um, he has more friends that he already knows in kindergarten than I think I've probably uh, gone out with in the past five years. So uh, he's doing fine. Um, and uh, the era of the pajama boy is over. That's true. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. We are just about there. We are just about. I think uh, parents of. Um, of, of children know that uh, kindergarten marks uh, just it's just a countdown in terms of how many months are left for you to have to uh, wipe their buttocks. So, um, yes, six is around six is when you no longer have to do six? that. Six? Yeah. Jesus. Five or six. Five or six. Depends. Some kids are a little more advanced. Some are a little bit more baby. Don't put salt Mine business t- out there like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, look. He's perfectly, if he wants to wipe his own ass, he can do that. I'd be perfectly happy with that. I get the sense that maybe he doesn't want to. Um, you know he what? likes the power play of it. No <laughs> hey, one Dad, LBJ. get in here. I got something it's for LBJ you. LBJ move. It turns yeah. out he's total LBJ. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, uh, just a reminder, uh, your support makes this show possible. Uh, you can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. For just uh, a handful of nickels and dimes a day, not even a handful, like a very small uh, person's handful, like not even a small person's, like a small child's handful of uh, nickels and dimes. You can support this program every day. And um, as a way of saying thank you, we give you uh, extra content every day. So that is um, as join the majority report dot com. Hearings are going on uh, as we speak. Tomorrow, the plan for us is going to be to um, to really pull out a lot of important uh, moments that are going to come out of these hearings. Um, 
And then maybe even on Friday, uh, what we'll do is have, if we can get it, because it's obviously difficult, um, genuine experts at this stuff are obviously watching this stuff in real time. So difficult to get on the show um, at, at noon, but we are working on that. But this is um, super consequential for a number of reasons. And um, we will play a footage of uh, a uh, Parkland victim's father who attempted to shake Brett Kavanaugh's hand. And it's interesting to watch Brett Kavanaugh completely turn on his heels and run away from this. Um, Without a doubt, this father was there to put Kavanaugh in that type of situation. But I want to remind everybody that we have been inundated with a number of stories about how great Brett Kavanaugh is a person. Put him aside as a judge. He's great in a carpool. He's super in a pickup basketball game. He wants, you know, um, he, he, he works at a, a homeless shelter. I mean, all of this, we've heard about how great he is as a person. Um, so it seems to me to be perfectly legitimate uh, to uh, put him... To, to test that premise. I don't know what kind of person turns on their heels uh, when they're introduced to someone like that and then call security on them. A good guy, I guess. And I will also say this. To the Republicans who are whining about this. This process was made illegitimate When Mitch McConnell said we're going to deny Barack Obama even a hearing on his nominee. Now, I may not have uh, wanted that hearing and and Barack Obama didn't do um, uh, play this thing politically well. But the process has been made illegitimate. And put aside all the Russia stuff. Anything else you want to talk about in terms of what uh, may make the election of Donald Trump illegitimate, Mitch McConnell himself attributes Donald Trump's win to keeping that seat open to an illegitimate act and keeping that seat open. So the idea that there's even a shred of legitimacy to this entire process is a joke. It's a joke. It's a fucking joke to say it was inappropriate for this guy to want to shake Brett Kavanaugh's hand. They are withholding hundreds of thousands of documents. In terms of the ones they delivered, they delivered the most sensitive ones hours before the start of this hearing. That is completely illegitimate and without precedent. There are documents that may show, and now it appears on multiple occasions, that Brett Kavanaugh perjured himself in the first time he went in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee to be confirmed as a a federal judge. One of those examples that he may have perjured himself was in regards to his involvement in the torture policy. The other one is his involvement in receiving documents from Manny Miranda. Manny Miranda was a staffer. I think at one point he worked for Orrin Hatch, and then he moved to majority leader as a staffer, uh, Bill Frist. And during the course of George Bush's, this is in the early aughts, during the course of uh, George uh, W. Bush's hearings on uh, judicial nominees, Manny uh, Miranda, and I guess this one might have been uh, Scalito, excuse me, Alito, um, That's what we called him back in the day. I transported back. He, Manny Miranda, apparently broke into the computers and or received from a, some type of mole working for Democratic senators, documents 
involving Democratic senators' line of questioning and strategies in attempting to question, potentially block, George Bush's judicial nominees. These memos and emails were stolen over the course of I don't know how long. And you will see Patrick Leahy ask Brett Kavanaugh as when you were White House counsel, did you receive any of these emails? Now, Brett Kavanaugh does not know what documents Patrick Leahy is, uh, has looked at. And I'm quite convinced that there's a lot of Republicans on this committee who don't know what documents Patrick Leahy has looked at. This is what happens, okay? They do this in, in, in suits all the time. Corporations will do huge document dumps. And unless you have a law firm with a lot of resources, those document dumps overwhelm you. And they don't even know what's in the document dumps. Because the theory is we're going to put 40,000 pages of documents in there and they've got 12 hours to look through them. Good luck. But sometimes this stuff, particularly when it's digital, if you have the right search terms, you can find some stuff. So back in the day, not only did... We don't know who got these memos. We have an idea who may have gotten them after this exchange. We know the Wall Street Journal got them and wrote an op-ed about it. We know a, um, some right-wing judiciary organization got them, wrote stuff about it. The Capitol P- uh, Police were called to seize the Senate Judiciary Committee's computer servers. And the sergeant-at-arms of the Senate did an investigation. This guy, Manny Miranda, had to resign from the Senate. And the sergeant of arms said to the Justice Department, referred it to the Justice Department for a criminal investigation into violations of lying to federal law enforcement and then other computer crimes. And, of course, the Bush administration at the time of which Brett Kavanaugh was of counsel, uh, refused to pursue any investigation. So here is Patrick Leahy. Now, here's one other thing. Patrick Leahy was a prosecutor. And uh, one thing about uh, good lawyers, when they're uh, deposing or they are uh, examining a witness, is they rarely rarely ask a question if they don't already know the answer. Now, when you worked at the White House, did anyone ever tell you they had a mole that provided them with secret information related to nominations? I I don't recall the reference to a mole, uh, which sounds highly specific, but certainly it is common, again, and the people behind you can probably refer to this, but it's common, I think, for everyone to talk to each other at times and share information. At least this was my experience. This is 20 years ago almost, where you would talk to people and so, the so committee. You, you, Pause you, it for one second. Okay, so highly specific, a mole. I mean, that's a very specific term. I mean, that involves like, I mean, as, as you know, Euphemistically, that would involve someone very specifically planted in a situation as a double agent. That's very specific. But I can tell you this, you know, people talk, people talk, people talk back and forth because Brett Kavanaugh says that because he doesn't know what Patrick Leahy knows. People and the committee. you, You never received an email from a Republican staff member with information claiming to come from spying? A Democratic mole? Uh, I don't. Rec- I'm not going to rule anything out, Senator. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if if I did, I wouldn't have thought that uh, anything. I wouldn't have thought that the literal uh, <laughs> you know, uh, meaning of that. But I, I, I pause it. Oh, oh, okay, okay. So if I did get an email from somebody saying that we have a spy or a mole, I wouldn't have thought that it was specifically either a a uh, furry little animal which would be the literal meaning of a mole, 
uh, that bores into things. Or I wouldn't have thought that literally we had placed someone inside there. So it's possible I, I may have gotten an email where someone said, we have a mole uh, in the Democratic staffs. And I would have thought like, oh, uh, they, they're just, that's just common parlance for like, I have a conduit to get information. Like, I'm just chatting with people. That's the I story. I have Google. That's the story. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mole. Mole. A search engine. Right. Lexus Nexus. Thought that uh, anything, I, I wouldn't have thought that the literal uh, <laughs> you know, uh, meaning of that. But I, I, I wouldn't have surprised you that uh, if you got an email saying you got that from somebody spying. Well, is there such an email, sir? I don't know. I mean, that's well, we'd have to ask the chairman. Pause it. Had. Okay, so there, uh, Brett Kavanaugh realizes, like, oh, 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 oh. Um, do you have a email to me that says from Manny Miranda saying that we have a spy, a mole that has given us information? Does that email exist so that I don't have to perjure myself again? <laughs> and now we get to the interparty thing. Now, we have different angles of this. This one, unfortunately, we can't see Leahy's face because Leahy has a look on his face, probably part and uh, function of Botox, but also in part... <laughs> A function of a guy who realizes, like, oh, this was too easy. Go ahead. Somebody spying? On the well, is there such an email, sir? I don't know. I mean, that's well, we'd have to ask the chairman what he has in his confidential uh, yeah. material. But, but here's the, uh, if you're referring to something particular, here's what I know. Hey, hey um, just stop a minute here. Reference twice. Pause it. Now, uh, now, this is important because Chuck Grassley just interrupted Kavanaugh. He didn't interrupt Leahy. Kavanaugh is trying to spin this off. Like, uh, let me just address a different topic and, and where I'm on uh, terra firma. And Grassley has to jump in here because Grassley needs to now pretend that he is not hiding documents that show Brett Kavanaugh knowingly received stolen information. Hey, um, just stop a minute here. Reference twice in your 30 minutes, and don't take this off of his time. You made reference. He, this You're talking about the period of time that he was White House counsel. Yep. That material is available to everybody. So, so, that, so that bit of the material about him that's marked... Uh, Committee confidential is now public and available. Is that what you're saying? If that's what the chairman's saying, no. we got a whole new series of no, questions. No, not if it, not if it's uh, uh, committee confidential. But so you, have have that. you have access to it. Not so but, that but I don't can forget. Eighty percent of the material we've gotten from the library is is on the website of the Judiciary Committee, so the public has access to it. Pause it now. Now, so what Grassley is saying is that we've taken all the non-incriminating stuff and made it public. We've made the incriminating stuff only the committee can look at and, of course, can't reference and can't show it to Kavanaugh and say, hey, Kavanaugh, do you remember getting this email that's addressed to you that we got from your files? That's from Manny Miranda that says, hey, we have we're getting stolen information. This is this is stuff you can rely on because it's stolen. This is not speculation. This is not one guy is at a bar with another staffer. This is this is for reals. So much so that if I had if I'm Manny Miranda and I can project into the future after I'm sending you this email that the sergeant of arms is going to recommend uh, criminal proceedings on this. Now, Manny Miranda was not aware of that at the time. But Grassley's got a problem. Because Grassley did not realize, Grassley may not even know these documents are there. He's just trying to claim, like, we've exposed everything. But, but Leahy's saying, like, well, if you've got no problem with these documents being made public, then make them public. On the website of the Judiciary Committee, so the public has access to it. No, I, Proceed. I, I want, I want Judge Kavanaugh. 
Now, now Leahy goes on to say, I want Kavanaugh to be able to look at these documents so he can answer the question. It's unfair that I know that he got an email saying that we have a Democratic spy, we have a Democratic mole. And I want Kavanaugh to be able to address these charges. It's the only fair thing that can happen. There's going to be a lot more of this. And I think we're going to have, uh, have this stuff to play tomorrow. And again, look, the bottom line is this. You cannot get the votes you need from Republicans until you lock up all the votes from Democrats. And we're not even close there. Because those Democrats running in deep red states where Donald Trump is still bizarrely popular... West Virginia. All the North Dakota uh, people mm. for Kramer were talking about the Democrats' crazy stunt yesterday yep. at the Supreme Court. North Dakota, Indiana, Missouri, but that's Alabama. Not, it's still not a majority of the population in any of these states, though, right? They're 60%. Oh, yeah. I think it's above 50% in most of those states. Support for, uh, for Trump. And so those senators are nervous. And what they need is a non-ideological reason to either slow this nomination or stop this nomination. And lying is non-ideological. And so that's what has to happen here. And then they start working on the Republicans. So. I didn't know about the mole. <laughs> Sorry, I plead pre-cleared you. Exactly. That's basically what we need to happen. <laughs> That's the strategy. You're trying uh, to get me with the mole. Well, good play, I'm... because I could care less if teenage girls have to die in an alleyway as long as I don't take the blame for it. I, <laughs> I have no doubt that most of those uh, senators are perfectly happy to vote against um, I, I think they probably don't care one way or another, as long as they have cover. You know, certainly they all know that at one day they're going to come back to their colleagues in the Senate and say, I need X, Y or Z. They just need a way to deliver it. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, this interview that uh, I did at Netroots Nation, I guess that was in early August. I don't remember when it was. Was it early August? It was early August. Uh, with Shockway Antar Lumumba. And back in November of 2017, I can't remember the date, but I interviewed, uh, and maybe it was on, I can't remember what, what, who was the author of that piece? Sarah Gilbert. Sarah Gilbert had written about Shockway Antar Lumumba, uh, who promised to be the most radical mayor in America. Uh, how he came to be elected, how he came to decide to do it, uh, was largely a function of his father having been mayor, I believe, in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and fascinating story. He is only uh, 35 years old, and um, I think in, in 10, 15 years, um, this guy's going to be a... a, a an important national figure has the potential to be. Uh, so enjoy this uh, interview. And then uh, we will obviously talk more about uh, the Supreme court. I'm going to tell all you fascists to make me surprised. Okay, continuing our coverage, Netroots Nation uh, 2018. I am sitting with Shokwe Antar uh, Lumumba. Correct. He is the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, we'll work our way back on, you know, uh, your, your family has a long history of, uh, of, uh, with, with the city. But uh, when you got elected, you, um, you made a vow to make, Jackson, Mississippi, the most radical city on the planet. Um, what's what's the plan? What's what's the plan? Yeah. 
Uh, well, I think the plan is, is to uh, re-envision the way we see electoral politics and, and how we see governance. Uh, typically, we allow someone to step up, tell us their vision for our lives, and, and make all of the plans for us. And so I think that we have to take charge and, and demonstrate self-determination and control of governance for ourselves. And so it's a process by which we're trying to give people more voice. It's a process where we're trying to bring uh, things like uh, participatory budgeting. Uh, we're trying to bring cooperative businesses where we invest in ourselves. Uh, where We're trying to assert the values that, that best represent and reflect our community at large. All right. So what, what are the um, what are the the processes that you follow to start to implement those type of things? I mean, well, uh, we've already initiated uh, people's assemblies, uh, which are a convening of uh, a quarterly convening of the community, which is spread around the city. We, we move to different locations to meet people where they are, where we present critical issues that we see as a community, where we not only see it as an opportunity to engage the community and inform the community, but to be informed by the community. It's a pressure mechanism that we utilize, and we're uh, now going through the education of what participatory budgeting looks like uh, so that we, we talk about moving away from models where we're finding value in what we're funding to a model where we fund what we collectively value. We are creating incubator funds for cooperative businesses, uh, changing policy for small business programs, and, and looking at how we can fill voids for ourselves. Uh, we see divestment. We see redlining in our community all of things that, that lead to a systemic issues that we continue to see flow and create these cycles of humiliation that people deal with. So how do we move more into a solidarity economy that moves into uh, a, digni a space of dignity and, and, and reflect more uh, our interests? All right, so what, what, I mean, what does participatory budgeting mean? I mean, you're educating uh, folks in, in, in Jackson, Mississippi. Let's let, educate we're going to educate a little yeah. more to it. Well, participatory budgeting isn't necessarily a, a new concept uh, around the nation. Uh, you have other cities and other spaces that are utilizing it, but I think it has to be tailored uh, to the culture, the specific uh, demographics of where you are. And so we can borrow examples from other places, but we have to tailor it to our specific needs. And what participatory budgeting is is, is uh, carving out portions of your city's budget uh, for the community to decide where they want those resources to be allocated, where, where they, their voices are, are implemented into the process instead of the traditional models where... Uh, it's all top-down. Where it's all top-down. And so it's no longer scratching where people aren't itching. It's identifying what, what people feel as our priorities, and that's the essence of politics. Politics is who gets what, when, where, and how. And so it makes no sense that the community has no say in... Right and who, who, who the who is, right, which should be themselves, uh, what they will uh, see their resources go into and, and how soon it is allocated to them. So I guess, I mean, to a certain extent, maybe I have experienced this in the, insofar as uh, I'll get an email from a school saying uh, there's a certain amount of money that's allocated. We need a certain amount of votes for, yeah. uh, you know, for the funding to go to a school in, in this district or to go to the library or something like that. Y yeah, but, but that, that's almost positioned, you know, with the, you know, it's, you're, you're being propositioned in an either or scenario right. uh, as opposed to really being at the table to say, uh, we feel that there should be more youth programming in our okay. city. Uh, we feel that, that we need to allocate more resources to mental health. We feel, you know, any number of things. Uh, that we feel that, that there should be uh, funding supporting. And so it, it's taking it out of the hands of, of an individual. So I there's believe, no slate that you're giving the, yeah, the, you the don't community. Give people the slate. It's, you, it's coming from the community is giving you the slate, essentially, and, and giving you the priorities. What, what we have begun to do is we've met in these people's assembly and broken into small groups, and we've walked around to different stations and talked about you know, what our priorities are, what participatory budgeting looks like to us. Uh, and, and at each one of these stations, it asks a critical question about your values and what you want to see emphasized. And from there, we, we broaden, you know, what, what has come out of those conversations and, and form the initial slate of questions uh, so that it's not propositioning people under a premise that, that we already kind of understand what your values right. are. Yeah. And so how much of the budget is... Uh, allocated for that. Now, where we are in Jackson is we have not 
start allocating our budget towards that. We are going through the education process of merely introducing to people the concept of what participatory budgeting is. And once we do that, then, you know, we, we are preparing our, our team with the city to allocate a specific portion. To do you it. have a sense of what that's going to be? Is it gonna it, it'd be reckless of me to say at this time, okay. so I won't say All that. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and how much, well, oh, so let me ask you it this way. How much, uh, what will be the functions that determine that amount? I mean, obviously, mm-hmm. one of the functions is going to be any of the pushback you get back from uh, from already invested, I guess, uh, recipients of mm-hmm. what the budget was last year. Yeah. Uh, w- well, well, what I do is uh, if those recipients uh, value their programs, then I encourage them to go be a part of the assembly and, and demonstrate the importance of their programming to the community so the community can make that decision and it leaves them far more informed. Uh, but the other things that, that determine that are is the state of the financial strength of the city. Right. Uh, you know, one thing that, that I've been dealing with, quite honestly, in my first year is establishing a foundation that we're able to pursue our objectives. Um, you know, Jackson is, has been in a, in, a, in a relatively weak financial structure. Uh, we have a lot of general obligation debt that is owed, uh, and, and it's been a can that's been kicked down the road for right. a number of years, and, and so now, you know, it's, it's upon us. And so early on, we have to figure out how we get beyond that mountain of debt that's in front of us. I don't know much about the demographics in, in Jackson. I don't know much about the tax base, but where where... Do you, when you look out at the, I mean, I, I presume if you're dealing with that type of debt that's been kicked uh, down the, the road, I mean, that could, it could cut either way. I mean, mm-hmm. you could have had plenty of uh, resources and people just didn't want to deal with it, or there could be a lack of resources and people didn't yeah, want to deal well, with well, it. Well, hindsight is 2020. Sure. Uh, and, and, you know, some of the decisions, you know, I may have felt were bad decisions at the time. Some of the decisions we've learned uh, that that they have not been as helpful to us as we may have hoped. Uh, but Jackson's demographic is an 85 percent African American city. Uh, the state of Mississippi is 40 percent uh, African American, uh, and so we've seen divestment. And so you've seen people leave. One of the higher um, uh, demographics, or one of the, the the greater demographics that we're losing at a rapid pace in the city of Jackson and the state of Mississippi, for that matter are millennials. Uh, and so uh, Jackson really has an opportunity unique to most cities to audition to millennials, but we're not taking advantage of it. Uh-huh. Jackson is a college town, really. You have 40,000 college students in Jackson. You have seven institutions. And so we need to identify what are the quality of life things that young people enjoy. And so that's, that's one of the things that we're taking a strategic approach to. But how do we you know, implement these kind of ideas so that we build the future of Jackson today. How do you retain those people who are coming in four years at a time and, uh, and have them start to build businesses and, and uh, be a part of the community? Well, you create an environment which is conducive to their success, uh, promote opportunities for you know, them to, to explore new business opportunities as, as the rest of the country is in this arms race for uh, Amazon. We should be building the next you know, small business that can you know, uh, operate in a way that they're, they're able to grow and develop and, and ideal, you know, kind of the next Amazon, right? Uh, whether you want, you know, those, the good and bad. Of that. I'm not really speaking right, to right. that. Uh, so that's one. But two, one thing that we've embarked on is uh, Mayor and the Millennials Council. Uh, so that we talk directly to millennials about what are the quality of life things that they, they look for. And so, uh, and why they have not found a place like Jackson to be desirable to them. We find that millennials like urban spaces. They like walkable cities, which Jackson is not. Mm-hmm. How do we make our city more walkable? They enjoy things like public art. You have a, a, a new generation that doesn't care for a car as much as previous generations. Right. Uh, bike share programs, all of these things uh, that, that are important to present them with. Uh, but, you know, also focus in on, on what are the opportunities that are established there. And so that's why I talk about... You know, the, the uh, development and the importance of small businesses, but the importance of cooperative businesses. Businesses, any business, a small business, even a black business uh, in a, in a uh, capitalist environment is a business that is about exploiting markets. And so once it is taken all from the market that it is currently in, then it will eventually leave for what it sees as a better market. Right. And so Jackson is not a city that has a problem producing wealth. It's a city that has a problem maintaining wealth. 
And so we need businesses which are part of their mission is not only uh, bringing in profit, but serving the community, uh, having that reciprocal relationship where within its, its mission and its values is to promote and uplift the community at the same time as, as pulling in um, pulling in wealth. And cooperatives necessarily do that because you have buy-in from a far greater scope yeah. of people. Uh, and, and, and it's not necessarily an original idea in right. Mississippi. If you look at the history of people like Fannie Lou Hamer, who organized uh, poor black farmers in the Mississippi Delta, uh, you know, I think that the, the, the thing that is somewhat new is expanding our understanding of what a cooperative business can be. And a cooperative business can be essentially anything. And as we talk about this socialist no- notion that people get sometimes fearful of, if you really take a, a snapshot of where our country is moving and where the world is moving, then you find that cooperative and business businesses are being embraced far more than what people realize. Sure, and there's yeah. uh, there's federal legislation out there now uh, to provide low-cost federal loans, I think, for uh, companies that have been privately owned, and you have a private owner who wants to sell it, and uh, this will allow uh, the workers to yeah. to buy but what I think strikes me as possibly new is having a city do it, mm-hmm. right? Well, well, a city cannot own a business. No, but so. a city providing and encouraging yeah. those and providing the funds for for those. Like, what, on what terms would you loan? I mean, is that, is that part of the program? Is uh, to to build an incubator funds, uh, and and it's you know basically looking at the mission of the the the, the business, whether it's consistent with the environment that we're trying to create. Uh, and, and, you know, capacity, le- learning all of those things and, and what the structure is. That's, that's the terms. But, you know, all of this is under the premise that when we look at our, our world, when we look at our, our nation, uh, the economy of our nation, you know, we've, we've been operating under this uh, flawed premise that something has gone wrong. And I don't believe that it has. I believe that the system is probably overperforming. And we've had the ultra-wealthy, uh, the multinational corporations dictating what our economy should look like. And so uh, we should not be surprised by the growing inequities uh, of wealth distribu- uh, distribution where you see the mega rich uh, becoming far more wealthy and the impoverished becoming far more po- uh, poor. You have uh, so few with so much and so, so many with so little. And so we have to change that dynamic and rewrite our system for ourselves. So we haven't gone off the rails. We've just gone further we had down. We have gone off the rails we, we just at gone all. gone further down yeah. the rails. We, I think that, that you know, we're, we're finally... Uh, being faced with the the um, the the consequences of our decisions, right? To not empower ourselves. Um, let's talk just a little bit about how um, you, with a platform to make Jackson the most radical city in the country, gets elected. Uh, part of that was there's a tradition there, and and and, and your father served as mm-hmm. mayor for. Uh, quite a long time. Well, no, my father was mayor for eight months. Oh, before, eight months before he dying. passed away. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. And and so, um, it, it, it and okay, it's coming back to me now. How you somewhat reluctantly mm-hmm. um, <laughs> decided to to run for for mayor? What was his program similar? I mean, what? what my father certainly. Um, I don't think that he had the opportunity to speak as much on the cooperative uh, enterprise uh, portion of it. But he certainly uh, was ideologically aligned with it, uh, and he was, you know, and he was in his foundation um, days trying to build right. the foundation with the city. Uh, but he, he, I come from a background of uh, the principal belief of our our mission must be to become more self determined as a community. Uh, that is the same ideo- ideology that my father, uh, you know, centered his his work on, and so. Uh, I believe that we have to see uh, electoral politics as a means to an end and not as the end itself. Right. And so uh, at that time, you know, I was focused on how my contribution could maybe be uh, demonstrated outside of government. He felt that um, electoral politics was was more tailored for me than it even was for him. Uh, And at the end of the day, uh, my father had a unique way of always getting his way. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) And so... uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm tremendously blessed to be in the space that I'm in. Um, and, and, you know, if it had not been for him, then I know I would not have been afforded this opportunity. But I think that we have to continue to have a well-rounded approach, a uh, comprehensive approach of how we change communities, understanding that we need, uh, when we have the benefit of uh, political leadership, that 
identifies with that philosophy, then we take advantage of that. But we must always have pressure from the outside to make certain that we hold people accountable, uh, that we are, are uh, creating the agenda for ourselves. Do you, do you think that you would have been able to uh, uh, become mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, if you're, if you're with this agenda, were it not for your father's tenure? I mean, in other words, we're, we're, was this an opportunity that you had that what you, you perceived as fairly unique to be able to do something that is fairly unique in the context of American politics? Well, I think you see a number of uh, progressive platforms rising up around the country. Um, I think that the way that, that we uh, speak to people's shared experience uh, ingratiates that message to, you know, makes our, our message ingratiating to people. For me personally, uh, I don't, I feel that that my father certainly paved the way for me that that you know quite naturally I may not have been able um to to take on this task at such a young age right uh he he presented a certain level, level of authenticity that has been extended to me and so uh I have a responsibility because I've had the benefit of sharing his great name that I live up to that and I don't disappoint people and so that is uh a responsibility that I don't take lightly. Um, and so do you have a, 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 how long is your term? Is it, I guess, a four, four year, years. Four years. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, do you have certain benchmarks that you're hoping to hit uh, over the course of that time? Mm-hmm. Do you, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, there's been some written about you in some uh, national publications, but not necessarily, uh, you know, I, I've, I've read maybe one or two things, maybe in the Nation magazine, maybe one or two others. Um, but um, do you have you have benchmarks for where you're going in the next four years? And then to the extent that some of these ideas can be spread around the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and and well, I guess as a subsidiary to that question, when you see uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez going around, I think, you know, at one point she'd go win her election, mm-hmm. but going around and trying to create a um, maybe caucus is too specific of a word, but some measure of solidarity across the country uh, with politicians that running for different positions. I mean, is that is is that a potential model that you see mm-hmm. down the road? Well, uh, so so my goals at this time um, are, are twofold. Uh, first, I look internally at what the values and, and desires of our community are. Uh, making certain that I never abandon or ignore that uh, in the pursuit of, of any ideal. And so, uh, you know, so we have benchmarks of, 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 of how we demonstrate progress and, and how we're eliminating the issues in our community. Uh, but then a larger focus is the connection that we see between what Jackson is facing and what many communities are facing around the nation and seeing the similarities there. And so we believe that Jackson should be a model for the rest of the nation. As we are aware of the historic traumas in Jackson and in the state of Mississippi, if a place that has been known for such horrible suffering can demonstrate a progressive agenda, then I believe it motivates the rest of the country when you see if progress can be obtained in the belly of the beast, then it can be obtained anywhere. Right. And so uh, it's, it's the premise, you know, my wife and I have a favorite or a show that we like watching called Madam Secretary. There was a quote on that show uh, a few seasons ago. <laughs> it's not the where, show I would have guessed. Yeah, well, she, <laughs> she picked it out for me, but I, I, do, I do enjoy it. I, it's, it's entertaining. Okay. And so he, you know, the husband says, uh, you know, what do you do when you see a lack of integrity everywhere you look? You find it in yourself and you begin to change the world from right where you're standing. And that really, I thought, summed up. What our mission must be is that in Jackson, we have to find integrity for ourselves. Mm. We have to find investment for ourselves. We have to find, you know, uh, the ability uh, to rescue ourselves and make that a model for other communities to follow. Make that, you know, a, something that becomes contagious, that breaks out and, and people begin to realize that we have to abandon uh, these traditional models of, of governance uh, that, that we can't stand for. Uh, you know, bigotry. We can't stand for for all of these uh, these these uh, dehumanizing uh, ideals that that have you know somewhat been uh, promoted recently. And, and you know, uh, we need to make that uh, you know when someone takes a 
a, uh, a bigotous position, we should make them feel uncomfortable in that. Right. Mm-hmm. D- is there a tension between that goal of changing the process of government and I imagine when you decide to run for mayor, you have some ideas of your own mm-hmm. about what will be good for the community. I mean, is there some tension there between the sort of like that process mm-hmm. of having as much democracy and allowing the community to make to be to have self determination and, and direct the government, but at the same time you come in and you're like, well, mm-hmm. I know uh, early child development intervention yeah. is really helpful to education or whatnot. Yeah. I'm just yeah, uh, you know there there can. There's a, certainly are circumstances that arise uh, that create the potential for that tension. But I think what, what really keeps me at bay for, for what may be my own ideas, and I, I believe in a concept of revolutionary elitism, where you, you feel that you understand issues better than everyone else, that you have a greater grasp on the issues, and that can lead you into uh, pushing an agenda that really reflects your ideals. And if right. you can only organize people who think like you, you're not much of an organizer. And so I believe that, that I have to be principally situated to uh, submit myself to, to the collective genius model where I embrace and give people opportunity to be a part of a democratic process and listen to them. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that I don't get on a microphone and, and share what my convictions are. It doesn't mean that, that I, don't, I don't say why I think that this is helpful to us. And that should just be one voice in a greater conversation. So you engage in that process yes. in the same way you say to these agencies, yeah. if you want to be part of the budget, go in and sell it to the community. Yeah, I, I, I have an, an, an opportunity to share with them. And, and I think, you know, I would hope that, that, that my perspective carries some level of weight with the community. But, you yeah. know. Is it helpful uh, being in a, uh, a city that is uh, 80% African American insofar as that, like, you don't have to be as... Um, you don't have to tip toe around sort of the racial history in this country and the presence of white supremacy mm-hmm. in, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, one of the stories about Barack Obama, I don't know if it's a story that I necessarily believe, but he was either um, justifiably or not inhibited in some respects by how a, a black man is supposed to uh, behave in the mm-hmm. United States and he doesn't want to be seen as being president of black people and, and all all those type of things i can't yeah. remember the author who wrote something to that effect but uh, i had an extended conversation with him about that but leaving aside the validity of that question for you is it is, is that give you a certain amount of space that m- most black politicians don't necessarily have well i, I think that you know um i would be disillusioned if, it, if i didn't say that it accounts for a certain level of psychological safety uh, but I, I guess, you know, what I feel liberates me most is, you know, kind of a clear perspective of, of what I'm trying to get out of the, the entire process. Uh, if, if it's about political ambition for me, then maybe I'm a little more careful, you know, to make certain that I don't ruffle some people's feathers. Right. But if, I'm, if my end objective is just to, to uh, empower my community, uh, just to change a condition, then I, I feel liberated to speak to that. And so uh, I, I think at the same time, even as liberated as I may be to speak to that, I have to recognize the limitations in the role. And so and, and understand what is, you know, a, a, a larger systemic issue as opposed to just a matter of, of who's holding what office. Uh, you know, the analogy that I use uh, in, in some executive leadership spaces is the analogy of the uh, plantation. You know, on the plantation, you had an overseer. And sometimes the overseer was black. Sometimes the overseer was white. And if you had a black overseer, maybe he didn't beat you quite as bad. Right. Maybe he beat you worse. Right. But no matter whether your overseer was black or white, you were no more uh, free. And so your problem was never with the overseer. Your problem was with the plantation itself. And so we have to start identifying the systemic issues that ultimately plague us because there are limitations in just merely identifying who, who runs the plantation, you know? Yeah, interesting. <laughs> um, all right, let me just ask you, Just uh, I'm curious as to uh, what uh, some of the authors or books that you, uh, that you read that, you've, that, you, that are mm-hmm. inspiring to you. I'm just curious. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I couldn't go without mentioning uh, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Uh, it's a very important book to me. 
uh, as I thought about becoming an attorney. I read that Malcolm wanted to be an attorney. And so I said that, you know, maybe I need to pursue being the attorney that Malcolm would have been, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I read uh, a book that, that talks about uh, the civil rights movement uh, called uh, We Will Shoot Back. Uh, that's an important book. Uh, and, and, you know, there have just been a number of uh, things. Uh, one of my favorite books uh, recently is uh, by uh, Chimamanga Adichie. Uh, that my wife uh, presented to me, we should all be feminists, uh, you know, allowing us to explore uh, even, you know, our own um, discriminatory practices as men, identifying that, that you know, as a man, uh, I am sexist. And, you know, it doesn't mean that I should rest within those sexist ideals, but I can't tell a woman what is and what is not sexist. I have to, you know, listen and, and explore ways to break free from, from that, uh, that practice. Shakwe Antar Lumumba, uh, Mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate our conversation. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, that's it. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, uh, that was from uh, Netroots Nation. Really fascinating guy. I think we're going to be hearing a lot more uh, from him uh, in, the, in the coming years. I certainly hope so. Um, all right, uh, we're going to take a quick break, head into the fun half of the program. We will talk more about, uh, obviously, the hearings to a certain extent. We're going to do, uh, tomorrow is going to be a uh, an omnibus uh, hearing show so that we can catch people up and um, and get a sense of, uh, of just where we are. I mean, the, the, like I say, the, the game is for those uh, maybe half a dozen Democratic senators uh, who are who are most likely to, at the very least, not obstruct to the extent that they can um, the Kavanaugh uh, nomination. Uh, but the sooner they come out saying they're against the Kavanaugh nomination because of procedural things, the quicker the pivot can be made to uh, pressuring someone like Murkowski or uh, Susan Collins. So... Uh, we will head into the uh, fun half. Just a reminder, your support makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. Buy that uh, Majority Report blend uh, if you can. Uh, also, I have to make note of the fact that it was a total coincidence that I'm wearing the same shirt today as I did that fateful day at uh, Netroots Nations. It does not uh, always, I don't want to freak anybody out that I was able to travel through time and space. It's just much easier to wear the same shirt. It shows shirt. how focused you are on your clothing choices. Yeah, exactly. I don't want Like a razor. Yeah. Just totally honed in on the clothes. Yeah. Uh, I was not necessarily the best dressed in that interview. <laughs> I don't know if you picked up on that. I, th I think it's. Are... I think it doesn't even need to be said. Right, that's true. Uh, today is a Wednesday, folks, which uh, leads me to believe that yesterday was Tuesday, and if that was the case, then last night was Tuesday night, and that would lead me to believe that uh, the Michael Brooks show uh, uh, was on. Is that the case, Michael? That is the case. Uh, we did. We forgot John McCain together. We debuted a new Matt Leck centered segment. Uh, really? Yes, indeed. Uh, now to add to the Griscom uh, centered uh, segment, Ken Klippenstein, who's a Klippenstein, excuse me, he's a really good investigative reporter, and we talked about it a lot. Follow of him stuff. on Twitter. Yeah, definitely follow him on Twitter. I do. Really, really good investigative reporter. We talked about a lot of stuff, but probably I want to highlight. He actually thinks that with an actual grassroots movement, that it really is actually possible that we could reverse the policy of supporting mass murder in Yemen. He actually thinks there is some opportunity to push Congress in the right way on that which is obviously really important. Uh, and then uh, new things in the post game, uh, And uh, this Sunday, illicit history of Lula da Silva, the Workers' Party, and Lawfare. We're going to do contextualization of all that Brazil coverage. So uh, patreon.com slash TMBS. Thank you. And uh, Jamie, uh, you have uh, corrected some audio issues, is my understanding. Yes, I can hear now. It's great. There you go. I'm still a little out of sorts from it, i got to say. It's weird when you can't hear what's happening on the screen. Uh, or on a radio show, it's even even worse. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of uh, radio shows, uh, what's up with the Antifada? Well, uh, I'm afraid we're a little bit late this week because we were on vacation all week last week and into Monday. However, we have three good things coming out possibly later tonight, at least one of them. Um, Sean's doing a little primer on historical materialism because we talk about it a lot, but we don't really explain what it is. He's uh, really putting us all to shame. I think his segment is great. Um, I've got an interview with a singer from a punk band. It's a very interesting punk band. They always have a little performance arty element uh, to it. I, I guess I, I talked about situationism a little bit yesterday. And uh, Andy's got some interviews on the nationwide prison strike. So okay. check it out. And that strike is still uh, going on for, I believe, another uh, five or six days. And yeah. um, I, I think we'll be getting information on it uh, for well after that. It ends September 9th, so five day, uh, four days from now. Uh, Matt. There's a new literary hangover this weekend on The Barbarous Years of Recent History. It's kind of a new type of episode that where it's just us sort of casually discussing a history book that we've all read. Uh, so people might like that. That might be uh, more frequent member content. Mm, interesting. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. Head into the fun half. The number is 646-257-3920. 646-257-3920 is the number if you want to be part of the program. We'll be right back after this. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Nah, 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 nah. 